Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, before we get started, Holly, did you have any housekeeping you needed to do? or? If you uh, would like to use the live transcription, it is available to you. It's either a, written on your Zoom screen as a CC option, which you'd click and you'd see all of the transcript, or under your more buttons, there's a place where it says show transcription, and you can click on that. Great. Okay. Well, um, hello and welcome. We know it's a busy Monday and we are really honored that you've chosen to spend your time with us today. Thank you. My name is Trish Garone. I'm the project manager of CLA's Summit Your Library project and I'm part of the Summit Your Library team along with Carrie Johnson and Holly McChris. Uh, the Summit Your Library project provides all interested California libraries with iRead resource guides, artwork, and graphics. And this effort is supported by IMLS under the provisions of LSTA administered in California by the, the state librarian. Um, I wanted to just give a quick shout out and thank you to our partners at iRead Illinois and in particular to our iRead California programming committee members. Uh, Holly, if you could just advance to the next slide. Um, you can see this year's committee members listed on the screen. So just a huge thank you to all of the members listed here and to their library administrations for all of the time and work they've put into the creation of the summer 2022 resource guide. Today, I'd particularly like to thank Nicole King of Santa Clara County Library, our IREAD committee chair, Rachel Lopez of Ontario Public Library, Charmaine Mendez, and Camille Hyatt of Moreno Valley Library and their respective library administrations for all their efforts and time in putting today's presentation together. So at this point, I'm gonna hand things over to Nicole King, this uh, past year's iRead program committee chair. So here is Nicole. Hi everyone, good afternoon, welcome. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our agenda, perfect. So uh, today we're gonna to be talking about our 2022 theme and also even looking beyond that, if you can believe it, to 2023 and even beyond that, 2024. So, um, but for this specific presentation, we're gonna be talking about uh, the theme for 2022, which is Beyond the Beaten Path, programming ideas um, are gonna be presented by some of us that were on the committee. So uh, first up, we'll have Rachel do early childhood and families. Camille will do a school-aged children. I'll be doing teens and tweens. Charmaine is going to be talking about adults and also outreach and conclusion. Um, at the end, we will do a wrap-up and Q&A. For right now, the best way for questions would be to type them in the chat, and then we will address them at the end. And I think that's all I have. So we can go ahead and get started with Diane, who's here from iRead and ILA. So thank you, Diane. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Nicole and Trish, for that, um, that warm welcome. And welcome, everybody. Welcome, California Libraries, to be reading Beyond the Beaten Path with us in 2022. Uh, my name is Diane Foote, and as it says there on the slide, I'm the iRead slash Illinois Library Association Executive Director. So uh, next slide, please. Um, I too have a little agenda. We have three years of themes to talk about today. I'll try to keep it moving along as quickly as I can. I know we have a full agenda. Uh, next slide, please. First up is, of course, I read 2022, read beyond the beaten path. I don't need to read this out to you. Hopefully you have seen it already in various places on the iRead website or in our iRead newsletter um, or on our social media elsewhere. Uh, but Read Beyond the Beaten Path has a broad focus on camp, all kinds of camp, camping out, but also space camp, coding camp, dance camp, all kinds of other things, um, other ways to do camp. You can even camp it up with a drag queen story hour, right? So there's lots of fun things that you can do with camp. Um, next slide, please. We are thrilled to have a really exciting array of illustrators. Everyone I believe here in California, unless you are new to California librarianship yourself, is probably pretty familiar with the way iRead works because you guys have been partners um, in iRead for a nice long time and you have a very vigorous uh, committee uh, that works hand in glove with our committee here in Illinois. It's been a real success story for us and hopefully for you as well. So one of the hallmarks of the iRead Summer Reading Program is our annual array of illustrators which change 
changes um, every year. We have um, some um, folks who come back year after year to give us uh, some of the spot art that you use. Um, but our hot feature artist for this coming up summer, uh, we're going to start off with Dave Pilkey or Dave Pilkey. He goes by either. You will know Dave Pilkey from Captain Underpants, of course, and Dogman. His artwork for I Read 2022 focuses on his dragon character, who's pictured here with uh, his kitty cat friends uh, right off the beaten path. Um, this dragon character will be our featured plush for sale in the store. So we hope that um, that everybody enjoys um, enjoys him. Next slide, please. Oh, and he's for the preschool age group. Uh, for school age children, we have Jessica Gibson, who is an up and comer, relative newcomer artist, um, whose artwork really caught our eye back when we first started looking with its warm colors and its focus on animals and children. These images are really small, the posters I'm seeing now on this PowerPoint. Uh, but when we go to the, when you go to the iRead website, you'll be able to see um, see it in much uh, in all its glory, a little bit larger size, larger file size. Um, it will, of course, all these things be included in your resource guides as well. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, you might know Jessica Gibson for her picture book, A Time to Roar. And uh, her artwork is also what's featured um, in my Zoom background today. Uh, the other day I was in another meeting and you should know I use this Zoom background uh, not just for iRead meetings, but for all kinds of um, ILA and iRead meetings, because I just think it's really nice. And I think the message of reading beyond the beaten path is a valuable one, whether we're doing summer reading or we're doing other things. Um, I turned around to reach something back here and, I, and someone said I just pulled it out of the tree, which I thought was kind of funny. I didn't plan to do that, but um, nice uh, side benefit to this kind of fun artwork. Next slide, please. Kyla Miller is our teen artist. They are a graphic novelist, best known for uh, the New York Times best-selling series that is listed here. And there are more titles than just the three that are listed here, uh, but one is called Camp. And so, of course, uh, they came to our attention when we were looking for an artist for a camp theme. Uh, click and act, most of them have to do with activities that you might do um, um, in, in terms of you know, performance or artwork or um, all kinds of other things. So um, this art also, like just Jessica Gibson's is very inclusive. Our uh, 2022 chair, whose name is Becca Boland of the Skokie, Illinois Public Library, likes to say that she tried to find um, someone who was missing, who was not represented in this poster, and couldn't find anybody. <laughs> so we do um, encourage our artists, that's part of our art criteria, to be, um, is rep to be representative of the full range of um, of human possibilities. So there, there we are with Kyla Miller and the teen art. Next, please. Steens is another graphic novelist. Uh, Steens is creating our adult and all ages artwork this year. You might know uh, Steens' archival quality. Uh, you might know the Heart of the City comic strip. Uh, again, these images are very small. And I don't know if you can see what is remarkable about these. Um, back when we first uh, started looking at illustrators for 2022, um, we were not in a pandemic yet. And then we entered into a pandemic. So what Steens has done is created for us two versions of this art, because when she submitted it, by the time that the art sketches came in, uh, our librarian uh, committee kind of went gasped because everybody was inside in the library and nobody was wearing a mask. Um, so we didn't know what the situation in summer 22 was going to be. So what we've done, um, thanks to Steens for doing this for us, she has two versions of her poster and we've printed this poster two-sided. You don't have to buy two sets of posters and you don't need to pick now. You just buy the poster and then you can flip it around depending on what um, what suits and what, what is the, the state of things in your libraries and in your communities next summer. So we really appreciate that flexibility from Steens. Next slide, please. Um, so we'll move on to another feature that we do every year of our um, summer reading program, which is a PSA that is available for download for you to use, or you can run it right off our website. It is load, uploaded onto YouTube. I think we're going to try to run it today. Um, so uh, go for it, Holly. This summer, we're going to read beyond the beaten path at your library. You can have fun reading, make cool crafts, and collect badges. I love badges. How do you earn badges? You read and do fun activities. Look, there's the badge for science fiction. There's sports. You 
Woo! Nature! Arts and crafts! Paddle over to your library where you can play games, win prizes, and collect badges. Summer reading for children, teens, and adults. <laughs> Thank you very much. That went very smoothly. Um, you might recognize that voice, those voices. They did the PSA for us last year as well. That is Becca Boland and her son, actual live librarians in their quote unquote side gig as PSA uh, announcers. Um, next slide, please. Hopefully you are um, familiar with our social media. We are present on a great um, variety of social media channels. We are most active on these four. Um, each year for the past couple of years, we have been creating specific Facebook groups, um, particular to a theme. We have an overall I, um, I read Facebook profile, but also cascading from that is a group that's particular to the theme. Um, and I am seeing a nice comment in the, um, in the, uh, chat, exciting art by amazing and diverse artists. So um, I had in my notes that I'm totally objective about this, but I think it's the best array of artists we've had. And um, we'll, we'll just wait till you see 2023. So thank you for, for that nice comment there. Um, so uh, next slide, please follow us on social media and chime in. Uh, as you all know, the resource guide is really the heart of the program. It is crowdsourced by librarians for librarians. Hopefully we have some folks represented here who have uh, sent in uh, contributions to the resource guide or have participated on our resource guide task force. It is chock full of program ideas, promotion ideas, crafts, scripts, bibliographies, articles, and of course the flagship part of the resource guide, which is the reproducible artwork. Um, I think that most people in California know how it works, but I um, just want to reiterate this art is yours to use in perpetuity. Once you have your resource guide, you can use it in years to come, you can use it in the winter, you can use um, old art if you like that from a, from a few years ago, if you have an, an older resource guide, um, basically you can use it for anything you like. All that downloadable artwork is yours to use. If you don't want to buy our t-shirt, you want a long sleeve t-shirt or short sleeve one in a different color than what we offer, you can take it to a vendor and have it put on that t-shirt or tote bag or what have you. Uh, so you can use it for anything you like. The only um, limitation to it is that that vendor cannot then take our artwork and use it on other things to sell. They can only uh, print stuff for you. Um, so speaking of vendors and shirts, next slide, please. I will, before we go to that, um, I'll show you some of the um, spot art. This is the spot art that you've come become accustomed to seeing. This is a tiny, tiny sampling of it. If you've used I Read before, you know that uh, each of our artists creates a full array of little pieces of spot art. This year, you've heard the, about the badges being mentioned in the PSA. Uh, we have badges that are numbered. We have badges that are unnumbered. And we have badges that are for genres. So each of the artists has an array of numbered and unnumbered ones, and Kyla Miller is the one who created our genre badges. So you can just, this is just a small sampling uh, from the variety of artists that we have. Uh, the two down at the bottom right, the moose and the raccoon, are bonus art from one of our artists from 2021, who is Zach Lehner. You might remember him. We had him do an extra complement of animal-themed artwork for 2022 this year. We're very excited about that. Next slide, please. Uh, these are Facebook covers. They're cover images. We have um, other types of social media cover images that are available in your resource guide that you can use, depending on which art you pick or you can rotate. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, here's where I got to speaking in vendors and shirts. Uh, we listened to librarian feedback that we got. We like to say that iRead is by librarians for librarians, and we really do listen to our customers and the people who use the program. Uh, so we had a question about, well, or, or do you have t-shirts that are available in Spanish? Do you have any incentive items that are available in Spanish? And we had provided a lot of the artwork and certainly all of the posters and bookmarks in English and in English and Spanish, but we didn't have actual items for sale. People would have had to take the art to their vendor and, and get it created themselves. Well, we now have a set of items that are in English and Spanish for sale for you. Next, the t-shirts are shown here. Uh, next slide, please. Here's another sampling of some of the items that we have in both languages at this point. And there's the little plush, the dragon plush. All right. Uh, so we have also um, a little intro to the store. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the store because I feel like most people in California know um, how it works. Um, would you just like to scroll through a landing on these just to, for a few seconds? Um, go ahead. Next slide. You can browse the iRead store at any time. You don't have to log in. Next slide. 
You do have to log in to place an order. Your IUD account saves all your information. You can pay via credit card. You can be billed later. Next slide. There's some information, helpful links for you there. I'm blowing through that because I'm assuming that you guys um, are pretty familiar with how this works. If you're not, or if you have questions, you can reach out to us at iread at ila.org. Next slide, please. iread 2023, find your voice. Our voices have power. Our, use our voices to share stories, express ourselves, and spark change. I'm not going to re out, read out this whole paragraph to you. You can read it yourself, but we're very, very excited about this, um, this theme that really um, meant, to, meant to capitalize on an expressive type of uh, overall broad thematic area, not just the, the words that we say, but what we write, um, how we express ourselves, and the actions we take each day. We think that this um, offers a great uh, range of possibilities uh, for you in libraries. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a few minutes ago, I said I thought our 2022 artists were fantastic, were the best array we ever had. I think I do say that every year. I'm going to say it again for 2023. Uh, so first off for our young children is Angela Dominguez. And you might know Angela from her um, award-winning illustrations in Mango, Abuela, and Me. Uh, here it's a Bell Prey honor for illustration. Uh, Mango, the parrot character, is going to be our plush for 2023. So we're very excited about that. Uh, Angela is also the creator of the Stella Diaz series. And and her artwork is going to feature uh, Stella and Mango both. Next slide, please. Joshua Magisic Powis Steckley is uh, the illustrator of Sharice's Big Voice, A Native Kid Becomes a Congresswoman. Um, Joshua is an Ojibwe artist. He creates how, what he describes as woodland art, which in his words uh, means black outlines, bright colors, and intricate styled pattern work. Um, obviously, this book is ideal. It's a perfect uh, book to showcase for a find your voice uh, type of theme. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Sharice Davids is the first openly LGBT Native American elected to the U.S. Congress. She's one of the first two Native American women elected to Congress, along with Deb Haland of New Mexico. So we're very excited to uh, welcome Joshua to our array for 2023. Next slide, please. Hannah Templer is another graphic novelist. You might be familiar with her popular Cosmonite series, or your teens might. She's doing her teen art. She's also the illustrator of the comic series based on the Netflix show Glow, G-L-O-W. Does anybody know what that means? Uh, which revolves around a fictionalization of the characters um, and gimmicks from a 1980s syndicated women's professional wrestling circuit, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. If that's not the most 80s thing ever. I don't know what is. Uh, so we hope your teens will be excited uh, by that. Yes, somebody new, Glorious Ladies of Wrestling. Thank you. Um, so now, last, but absolutely not least, next slide. We are beyond thrilled to have 2021 Caldecott medalist, Michaela Goad, uh, providing artwork for our adult all ages poster. Uh, this is the one that we have the completed poster for already. Many thanks to uh, Jill's magic. Uh, Jill is the creative genius behind all of the artwork that gets created from uh, what the artists submit us in the raw form to the posters and bookmarks and items that you see um, in our program. Thank you, Jill. I know she's here. Um, so Michaela Goad is best known for We Are Water Protectors, which was her uh, Caldecott Medal winning book. Uh, but even before uh, that award, uh, she was on our committee's radar for uh, 2023 for Find Your Voice. She also has a new book coming out. It's out now, I think. I uh, Sang You Down from the Stars by Tasha Spillett Sumner. And that is the artwork that's featured here. And obviously a book called I Sang You Down from the Stars and the artwork from it, again, uh, is a really nice interpretation of the Find your voice theme. Um, Ms. Goad is an enrolled member of the Tlingit and Haida Indian tribes of Alaska. And some of you may know that one of our most recent statewide partners is the state of Alaska. So they are very happy to have, um, have uh, Michaela among our, our artists for uh, the upcoming year. Uh, so now I think that's the strong story of artists we've ever had. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll say the same thing next year. Next slide, please. So we are looking for resource guide submissions now uh, for 2023. The resource guide is in development now, and we want you submitting an idea for a program, a bibliography, an art or craft, an activity or a promotional uh, project is a great way our librarians in our partner states can have involvement in development of our program. You get a publication credit, um, and it's a really nice way to really ensure that iRead is by librarians for librarians. Our submission process is open now. That's just a screenshot of 
of what's on our website. Uh, there's space there to submit an idea. Um, if you haven't done it before, or you've always kind of wanted to, but wondered what it entailed or how long it has to be or how involved it has to be, um, there's a great deal of information on that website about what we're looking for, including sample submissions. Um, you've all used the resource guide or you'll be using it next summer. Uh, so now's your chance to contribute, pass it forward and, and contribute to future programs. So uh, next slide, please. Believe it or not, it's not too early to talk about 2024. If you uh, were sharp eyed, you saw on my agenda screen that we've already announced the uh, theme for 2024. I'll get to that in a minute, talk a little bit more about it. Uh, but first I wanted to share a little bit about how we develop the themes. And the Californians probably know a little bit more about this because your committee is intricately involved with our committee. And so participate in all of these conversations uh, from the very beginning, from the various earliest stages of theme development. Um, so the, these are uh, the criteria that we use to develop our theme. Uh, you might uh, note that uh, one of our uh, criteria says include the word book, read, or library, or related. We used the or related uh, out when we talked about find your voice, <laughs> because we felt that finding your, that voice was also about, about reading and about, um, and about literacy. So uh, we are uh, putting find your voice under the related umbrella under that criterion. At any rate, next slide, please. Our theme for next year, broadly, thematically, was conservation. We wanted to talk about conservation, not only of the earth, but also of ourselves. We've had a really hard time these past two years, especially people in front-facing, public-serving uh, careers like all of you. It's been really tough, and we need to engage in self-care as well as care for the earth. And so uh, both aspects of conserving ourselves and conserving energy and conserving the earth and the animals that we share the planet with and the plants that we share the planet with, um, we wanted to find a way to bring all of that together um, under an umbrella. Um, and so our, we, our tagline, we sourced a whole bunch of taglines. We put out some voting in a Padlet. It was uh, normally, you might remember us coming to CLA and we've got a poster with the various taglines and people put stickers next to their favorite. We had to figure out a way to do that in the virtual world this year, right? And last year too. So our tagline that received by far the most votes far and away out of any of the others is read, renew, repeat. So that is um, 2024. We don't have any artists yet. We are first starting now to uh, brainstorm some. Uh, we hope this will be inspirational to the artists that we invite to uh, participate in 2024 um, and to our librarians and your patrons. So uh, thank you everyone for listening to me. Um, I hope I didn't speak too fast. I do wanna save time for the other people on the agenda because they've got great stuff to talk about. Uh, we will have time for questions. I see that there's been a few um, in, the, in the chat already and we can answer them at the end of the session today. So thank you so very much, everybody. Wow, thank you, Diane. That was a lot of great information and I am super excited about the artwork this year and next year and I'm sure the year after that too. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our programming ideas for 20. Now we have to reverse time, but really still fast forward. I don't know, it's, it's a weird time anyways, but for summer of 2022, um, off the beaten path, our um, programming ideas are going to start with Rachel, who's talking about the itty bitties. Thank you, Rachel. Hey, everybody. The itty bitties. I love that. <laughs> My name is Rachel Lopez. Um, I'm very excited to give you a few quick ideas for little learners and their families for summer 2022. Um, next slide, please. So I like to put my early learning programs into three different categories when I plan them as it really helps branding and it makes it easy on myself and my staff. Um, and I group them into these three different categories. Uh, the first one is dramatic play for little learners. Um, for me, dramatic play, you know, I remember having a blast in preschool or helping out with my child's classroom. And I thought dramatic play was just one of the most incredible programs to see come to life with imagination and play and wonder. And dramatic play is really crucial for self-selected uh, and self-directed approach to early learning. It involves reenacting activities for situations that children usually observe or that they learn about through books or through um, school. And they engage in so in imaginative uh, activities. So from working at a mechanic shop to being a pilot on an airplane and at a cardboard, dramatic play is so important for a child's development. 
The next one is Reggio Emilia. I've been, oh, not yet. Sorry. That <laughs> uh, is uh, Reggio Emilia. And I've been offering these type of programs for at least, uh, gosh, probably about 10 years now. Um, and it's really the easiest and the least expensive type of program that I've ever offered at the library. Um, and a quick summary without going into all of the logistics of this type. Number one, it's the environment. The environment is a child, um, is one of the child's teachers. You bring natural materials into the library or you take the little learners outside to experience the environment around them. And because it's usually, and it, it always involves natural materials, it's really cheap. So I like that with my budget. Um, and then the last one is the STEAM for Little Learners, which, you know, um, we have all done STEAM or STEM programming for all ages. And this one never gets old. I'm always learning right along with them. Um, before I get started on my program um, ideas, we are still, you know, dealing with COVID precautions. And with little learners, for those of you that work with them, it is a little difficult to, you um, put on programs because they're usually the most attended. Um, it's really hard for little ones to recognize personal space and, and all of those different precautions that we really need to institute. So um, what I've been doing, we started um, in-person programming and we are getting everyone back. Um, they're very excited to come back. So I have implemented stations. I'm utilizing more space than I ever have before. So big thank you to my staff and to um, for allowing me to kind of go into their different departments and put up stations. I limit the amount of kiddos that can be at each station. Um, and so far, it's been really great. We are also instituting, um, implementing ticketing. Um, so it's been so far so good. Uh, we, you know, we're still getting hundreds of people attending, but safety wise, it's, it's been really um, great. Okay, next slide, please. So the first one is dramatic play for little learners. I put a lot of ideas on here. I have done um, camping uh, dramatic play before in my library for little learners. So I've had a lot of fun doing different things such as roasting marshmallows over an open fire where the kiddos helped me uh, put together a faux bonfire with tissue paper and cardboard boxes. And I bring six from outside and we make together marshmallows out of either foam or stockings or uh, socks stuffed with little batting, um, and they pretend to roast marshmallows. Uh, we love building tents. You know, who doesn't like building tents? My kids still build tents um, in the house. Uh, you can utilize your, your bookcases or your chairs and tables and set up a camping. You can do it ahead of time, but I think it's really fun to do it right along with the little learners and their families. They get a blast. They get a kick out of it. And it's a blast. Um, again, bring all your teddy bears and your stuffed animals. They can bring their own. Um, we're kind of limiting stuffies at work due to um, COVID, but they can bring their own and kind of uh, they can hang out with them as they go from station to station. We, other than on top of camping, you can also do dramatic play tie-ins such as like you're at a ranger station. You can set up a ranger station, make sure everything's clearly labeled and organized. Um, you can go on a hike at your ranger station or, or while camping. So you can uh, put up pictures or have little ones draw pictures of uh, special places that they remember going on vacation and put them up around the library. And then you give them a little map and they can go and mark off each location and they get a little stamp or sticker at each one that they find. Uh, you can go fishing. Fishing, I use this activity in a lot of my programs, from like my winter program that I'm doing next week to this one that I'm planning on doing for summertime. Just get those really long dowels, um, put a paper clip at the, or a magnet at the bottom of it, and then you do a little faux cut out of a stream or a lake, and then you put your fishes in there, all different sizes and colors. And then you put a paper clip on them, and they can go fishing. And then once they catch the fish, you can throw in some stem and you can have them sort according to size or color or count along with them, do some simple addition and subtraction. They get a kick out of this. And a lot of times they want to take the fish home and that's say okay because it's really simple to recreate. A uh, fun one that I want to try doing is a blow up raft or uh, some sort of canoe or, or boat, or something that I want the kiddos to, um, we're going to create little oars. And, you know, you can sing row, row, row your boat. Um, that you can even 
help have them help you create a little uh, makeshift raft or so forth out of cardboard boxes. Um, I'm really excited to see that one come to life this summer. Bird watching. Bird watching you can do if you're doing dramatic play for camping or for your ranger station. Put up pictures of birds throughout the library. Give the kiddos um, a legend or a map of, of the different types of birds and then they can recreate their little binoculars using the toilet paper rolls or provide some spell ones or play ones. And then they can go around and search for the birds and then we can talk about them. They can come back and draw their favorite bird that they saw on their bird walk. Um, and then of course, play nature sounds. I think playing nature sounds in the back of any of these programs would be so much fun. And then last one, and right in the middle, throw up pictures of um, you know animals that they might see while camping or while hiking, and then have them recreate what they've seen on their hike in the library or camping in the library. And then you can put it up right next to them. That's really, really a fun activity that my little learners love to do. Okay, next slide, please. So Virgia Amelia, Again, you're just bringing nature into the library as the child's teacher, or we are taking them outside. And in right now for safety, it's so nice to implement these type of programming outside um, with the fresh air and you can space everything out. So some really simple ideas. I love the one in the bottom left corner where you go outside and you collect leaves together. And then you have little ones create stained glass throughout the library and you can leave up during the summertime just using a big sheet of contact paper. Um, nature walk bracelets. I love doing nature walk bracelets. You get a piece of contact paper or even just inside out a uh, like packing tape and you can tie it around their wrist or they can even wear one um, like as a headband. And then you go and collect different um, natural materials outside. And we do want to remind them, you know, you're not you're not picking flowers or you're not pulling grass. We're just trying to go outside and see what's on the floor that we can take without disturbing the environment. And then they come and they just put it around their, their bracelet or their headband. And then we share what we found. And it's really a pretty and pretty cool activity. Um, again, when we go outside and we get our leaf, you can then go gather some paint chips at, at your local Home Depot or Lowe's and you can have them sort by color or shades. Uh, you can use different natural materials that you find on your nature walk and use them to write the alphabet or their whole name or numbers or draw shapes with them. You can uh, create odes to nature using homemade clay that you can do together and natural materials and you can place them around the library just like this one that we've done on a, on a trunk. Um, and then they love to come back during the summertime and, and look at them. You can make all sorts of natural uh, types of paint or paste or slime using all the smashed leaves um, and they can paint pictures um, with all the different you know you might use berries or leaves to make paint and they can create their their artwork using those and then my favorite is making self-portraits out of natural materials so you can collect rocks and sticks and you can make your face and your hair and it's it's really fun Next slide, please. So STEAM program ideas, um, my favorite, the, I'm saying that a lot. A lot of these are my favorite and I have done these multiple times. Um, so I'm very, I love them all. My favorite though is, for this one is the Marshmallow Constellations, which this would actually be a great idea with one of the camping dramatic plays I forgot to mention is you build like a cardboard box and you paint it black and then you poke holes and you put the little uh, twinkle lights inside and you have the kiddos go inside and then they can look at the night sky or uh, create their own constellations or you can even put different um, constellations up and they can come back and recreate them using these marshmallows. You can paint with natural materials. Uh, we love painting with leaves and sticks and uh, all grass and so forth. And then on top of making your own paint. Uh, you can build using some more materials. You know, you can build your engineering skills. You can uh, build towers or bridges. You can make tents for your teddy grams out of uh, toothpicks and gumdrops. You can, with all the uh, rocks that you collect on your nature walk, we can do some math activities. You can do sorting activities. And then uh, we can also teach symmetry to little learners. So you just get those, um, those uh, unbreakable mirrors 
and then either pictures of nature or go outside and pick a leaf and you put it um, right next to the mirror and they can you can talk about symmetry and you can draw different um, ideas on um, the different symmetry that they see out in nature or even in the library. And then another idea, which I forgot to throw some really cool pictures up here is uh, sensory bin ideas. Sensory bin ideas are huge. And I do know that, um, again, not to be a Debbie Downer, but you know, with the COVID, it's, that was my hardest thing to implement again. Um, once we open, because you know, all the little ones want to come and play with the dirt and, and materials. And so it was very important to, again, do stations or limit the amount of people constantly um, cleaning the sensory bins after uses, usage. And so some of the sensory activities um, that I want to try this summer are sensory smelling tubes where you put like pine needles in one, um, you know, cranberries in another, grass in another one, and then you have them smell it and they have to guess what they're smelling. You can do a forest sensory bin, you can fill with moss, rocks, sand, leaves, branches, and plastic animals and have them play and um, create scenarios and stories, make sure that you know you're asking what they're doing. Um, and then sensory bin with your water table, we can build boats and determine which boats flow and which, what sinks. You could throw different uh, materials in there to determine that. Uh, it's a oh, water bin with dirty rocks. I, they love car washes. They love any, I put my farm animals and I put mud on them. They love cleaning them. So rocks, go outside, grab some rocks, make sure there's dirt on them and then give the little, little owners some scrubbers and they go to town and they love it. And you have your little clean bin next to it. Go on a bug hunt, you know, use shredded paper inside your sensory bin and hide plastic bugs in it and instruct the little ones to scoop out with their bug nets and sort them in another bin. And uh, next slide, please. So some bulletin board ideas. I do like to implement a lot of passive programming during the summertime and I change them out weekly. And so some ideas um, that I plan to do this summer are put, and this is all on a bulletin board. Um, I use a lot of Velcro and then I have buckets or baskets below and really simple instructions. So the first one is you put uh, different colored tents. So, you know, you have your red, your green, your yellow, big tents up on the bulletin board and then you have those the same colored sleeping bags in a basket below and you just instruct little learners to match the colors another one is create patterns of camping gear so you can uh you know do a picture of a flashlight a bear a tent and then a blank spot and then all of the other pieces are down below and you have to instruct them to uh, finish the pattern you can put uh pictures of campfires up on the board and instruct little learners uh, to match the amount that is written on the campfire and put cotton balls, just tape cotton balls up. Um, and then another one is you have little learners, uh, you, so you use chalk on your black butcher paper to draw random lines and shapes. So just, you know, zigzag here and a squiggle there. And then you instruct little learners with um, the little tiny star stickers to create their own type of, uh, their own uh, constellations up in the sky, shadow play, put the shadow of different camping gear activities on the bulletin board and in your baskets below, you have the actual picture of them and the little learners have to match the pictures with the shadows, with their shadows. And then the last one is living versus non-living. You divide your bulletin board into living and non-living spaces and you put all the different camping themes from you know, your animals, to your flashlight, to your trees, to your bugs, to your compasses. And then you instruct the little learners to put them in the appropriate spaces. And then the, oh, sorry, this is the last one. Um, map collaboration. He put up a large piece of butcher paper and put a few images that you would like to see on a map just to get him started. You know, maybe draw a river or a couple of mountains, some, just a few landmarks. And then you leave out crayons in your basket. And then throughout the summer or throughout that week, the little learners just um, draw their own different um, landmarks or um, things that they see in nature or while on camping. And at the end of that week, you'll have a beautiful map that you can display for the remainder of the summer. Last slide, please. All right, friends. Well, that is it for now. Um, my name has recently changed to Rachel Chasey, but I have, I'm lagging on formally changing my name. So you can reach me at um, the email here. Um, I I know there is not a lot of text, but I do love receiving inquiries of more in-depth details, or I can 
um, point you to the right direction um, or instructions on how to do anything that I presented today. So please reach out. I really look forward to hearing from you. And now we have Camille Hyatt for school age children. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm going to be offering some programming and display ideas for school age children. And my name is Camille Hyatt. Uh, next slide. So there's a wide range of options for displays with the Read Beyond the Beaten Path theme. Uh, you could do camping, hiking, gardening, trees, nature, or animals. Uh, one animal display you could create is a height comparison chart where kids and adults can see how tall they are compared to the heights of animals. So this could be a chart like the one on the left, or it could be a whole wall size, life size silhouettes of animals with the heights written next to them. Um, that way with the full size silhouettes, the kids can see the real size of animals and compare. Um, there's a lot of great benefits to using displays. Uh, you can promote specific library items or inform patrons about a topic, or they can just be like a good way to grab attention. So getting a chance to talk to the patrons. So just a conversation starter piece. Um, once you get the chance to talk to patrons, you can tell them about upcoming programs and events, because I think we all know the best way to promote is by word of mouth, since signs are a little bit tricky. Uh, next slide. Um, passive programs are another less staff intensive option for engaging with patrons and getting them excited about summer reading. A passive program that can be really fun for the kids is a take on something that most of us have done uh, in one form or another before, a uh, scavenger hunt. So you can add a summer reading twist by making it animal themed. Uh, you can hide animal pictures throughout the library, give the kids a card with the animal tracks and name on it, and a blank space for them to write down where in the library they found that hidden animal. And once they're done, you can check their answers at the front desk and give them an incentive. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the popular I Spy book series. Uh, you can create a passive program around this series using supplies that you already have in the library and create your own I Spy game at the front desk. So incorporate nature or camping elements to fit the summer theme. You can hand out cards that show what can be found within the display and award patrons with incentives, or it could just be a way to grab attention and start a conversation with patrons to tell them about the summer reading program. Um, an interactive passive program that still requires very little material and staff time is handing out badges to kids for reading certain genres, checking out certain books, or checking out any books at all. So I know we have the virtual badges. Um, these could be printed, they could be made into stickers or stamps um, and done in person. So whenever an item is checked out or a certain genre, uh, you could give those stickers to kids or stamp a stamp card that you hand out. That way um, the kids are gonna be able to earn the badges in person and they always love to get stickers and stamps and something that they can hold. Um, Next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna be moving on to STEM activities that fit into the summer reading theme. These can all be done with school age children and families, and they all incorporate STEM concepts that kids can understand. So the first one is boat building. Uh, you can build boats using supplies like foil, straws, paper, rubber bands, cardboard, duct tape, um, and other recycled materials. So this one's pretty inexpensive because you can just kind of gather these things and you don't have to have a specific set of materials. That could be the challenge that you give a certain thing and they have to try to build a boat out of it. So you can build different kinds of boats to see what materials and designs work best. It could be a structure program where directions are given and they have to follow them step by step, or it can be more open-ended and you just hand out the supplies and then their challenge is to come up with the best boat using those supplies. Uh, next slide. Uh, using Play-Doh and plastic insects, you can have the kids create their own insect fossils. Uh, so just press the plastic insect into the Play-Doh 
in order to form a mold and then let it dry. So that's a pretty quick activity. So if you wanna expand, um, you can reach out to the local entomology department from your college, a college nearby, or a local nature preserve and see if they can bring in some real insects, real live insects, to let the kids see them up close and ask questions. Or um, for a little bit of extra cost, but not too much, you, sorry, you could get an ant farm or butterfly garden that you just have in the library all summer. So the kids can get a chance to look at the ant farm and see the butterflies or see the butterflies grow. And at the very end, if you wanted to, you could have a butterfly release party where you let the butterflies free once they're fully developed. The kids will love being able to watch the butterflies grow. And you can even post um, social media updates every week to keep the whole community engaged with that program. Uh, next slide. Have the kids become paleontologists for the day with this project. Uh, so for this one, you'd wanna pre-make the dinosaur fossils using plaster of Paris and a fossil mold. And then you would bury them in a sandbox for the kids to dig up. So it could be one large sandbox that all the kids are digging in, or you can make individual sandboxes for each kid uh, using a shoebox or a plastic Tupperware container. So the kids will dig up the fossils using a small trowel or a little plastic spoon and a paintbrush. And once they find the fossils, they can brush off the sand and paint them. Uh, use this opportunity to teach the kids about fossils and how we use them to learn about dinosaurs. Next slide. Recreate the best part of camping with s'mores solar ovens. All you need is a hinge box, a shoe box, or a pizza box to work, foil, plaster graph, and the sun. Have the kids put together their solar ovens and stack up their s'mores and then leave them out in the sun for about 20 minutes for them to melt. Use this cooking time to explain how solar energy works and how the sun has been used to cook for many years. You can read a book about camping, teach wilderness survival tips, or gather around and tell scary stories or sing a song or two. Uh, next slide. This homemade thermometer is a great way to show kids how thermometers work and explain heat, temperature, and thermal contraction and expansion. This is a model of a liquid thermometer, which were used before the digital thermometers that we're used to. You can test the thermometer with a bowl of hot or iced water or even your body temperature. Uh, next slide. Uh, bring the night sky inside with these luminaries that you can make using printed images of constellations and just a few more inexpensive supplies. Learn about astronomy and the constellations with these. And you can make this a standalone activity or it could be part of a more expansive um, camping theme program or a space camp program. Next slide. Use these phases of the moon projects to learn about astronomy and the moon cycles. Kids love an edible project. So the Oreo one on the left is sure to be a hit. Uh, pair these projects with some NASA recommended moon activities to sneak in some science too. Uh, next slide. Learn about water pollution and the filtration process with this fun and simple project that shows the kids how water filtration works. Look at the difference between the water before filtering and after. Expand this project by adding oil, food coloring, or soda to the water and to see how effective that filtration system is. Use these same supplies again for future programs about the environment. Next slide. All right, um, I'm providing a link to the craft instructions that I was mentioning and any printable handouts uh, that I mentioned, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, feel free to email me with any questions or to learn more about any of the programs I mentioned. And I'll be handing it over now to Nicole to talk about teen and tween program ideas. Thank you, Camille. Um, so I'm used to being towards the end of the presentation and having no time. 
So <laughs> um, for the teen stuff, I'm teen and tween stuff. It's really more bullet points and some talking points, but feel free to email me with any other questions or specifics about programs. And also a lot of them I got from the resource guide. So if you get the resource guide, you'll get some more detailed instructions. But so it might seem like I'm going really fast, but it's because years passed. I'm always towards the end and this is the time I'm left with. But we don't want to skimp on those ideas for the littles because they're so cute. So next slide, please. So first, I want to start with some ideas for teen and tween events. Um, I was a teen librarian for a really long time. But honestly, most of the kids that came to my programs were tweens. They were younger, on the younger side. So some ideas that are in the resource guide and that I came up with myself, um, the meme challenge, campy movie night, um, ghost stories, campfire night, or an indoor camp out. Um, I've done prior to, or unrelated to the summer reading program, I have done like um, where the kids can come and make forts inside the library. And you might think, oh, forts, that's, that's for young, young kids. No, my son is 12 and spent almost his entire uh, Thanksgiving break in, a, in his room in a giant fort. So it's really not just for little kiddos. Um, also weekly camps. So as a parent of a tween, um, trying to plan out somebody's, uh, my child's like summer activities, um, I found that uh, camp style works best. So I would rather go somewhere where um, I can do an hour a day as opposed to four Wednesdays in a row, if that makes sense. So we kind of shifted our summer reading program to do more camp style. So we would do all of our art programs in one week, all of our STEM programs in one week. Oh, Jeremy wishes he was in a fort right now. Okay, see, it doesn't matter. There, there's no age limit to forts. Um, so, um, so that kind of worked better for our attendance too. So I would just do projects um, throughout the whole week. And then it also added drying time. So if there was an art or a STEM pro project that needed more time, um, I could kind of expand my projects with the kids, with the teens and the tweens, because they were able to leave them that night because they were going to be back the next day. Um, also, uh, trail mix, s'mores, hot chocolate, anything that has to do with food. Um, and then also swaps. So we've done, um, we've done a clothing swap before. Um, we've done a book swap before. So those are kinds of uh, things that teens and tweens like. Next slide, please. Um, of course, when you're doing summer reading for teens and tweens, you've got to have some crafting ideas. Um, some ideas are macrame, so there's actually a really good um, tutorial inside the resource guide. Water bottle decor, so I mean, I don't have, do I have one with me? Hold on. I'm a teen at heart, it's true, but you know, everybody wants these stickers to put on their hydro flasks and all these other wa fancy water bottles, so you can do a project with that. Paracord bracelets, tie dyes, also cool again. I don't know. So uh, just some other things that some teens and tweens uh, might be interested in. Next slide, please. Um, just again, some more ideas. A DIY magazine silhouette. That is that bear um, on the slide. I thought that was really cool. Um, survival emergency kits. They can make mini emergency kits um, out of Altoid tins. There's so many ideas about different kinds of kits you can make. Um, I thought that felt nature scene was really cool. A lot of times when I do projects like this, I actually get the teens and the tweens involved in the pattern part of the project. So sometimes, you know, if they're younger, I might make the pattern for them and they can cut it out. But I kind of like working with the older kids because they can design their own pattern and it's another element to the project. Um, and then I love this rock, rock cactus garden, um, also with painted rocks. I thought that was kind of cool. So next slide, please. So again, you know, these are just some ideas for some passive programming, nature bingo, nature photo contest. Um, they can take photos with their phone. They can post it on Instagram or, you know, any sort of a social media, whatever they're using now. I don't know. Scary um, ghost story writing contest, make and takes and grab and goes. So, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that regardless of where you are in the state, your county or your district might be in a different spot based on what COVID is like where you are living. So I like to make sure that a lot of my um, craft programs are simple enough that I can do them as a make and take or grab and go um, for outreach events. And also if you just don't wanna have a whole bunch of people hanging out at the library yet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then something that I have learned during these whole two years is that um, virtual programs are okay. You know, I felt like I was always to myself, wouldn't that be cool to do it on Facebook? Wouldn't that be cool to do it on YouTube? And then, you know, we had to because that was our only option. 
So now I kind of don't want to give that away or give that up as we move back into um, in-person programming. So speaker series and presentations, virtual tours are super popular. Um, video tutorials for your craft program. So, uh, you know, if we do a grab and go project, we always make sure to film a small video that they can go back and watch, especially since we're not meeting in person. Uh, hybrid programs, streaming your programs at the same time as you're doing them in person, and also using social media for contests. Next slide, please. And that is my information. If you want to email me, I will pass it now on to Charmaine. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry, this is Trish. I'm just gonna jump, jump in. We're running a little bit late, uh, long. We will be sending out a recording of the presentation to everybody. And uh, we hope you can stay with us for about 10 more minutes. Um, but okay, take it away, Charmaine. Thank you, Trish, and thank you, Nicole, for the wonderful ideas. My name is Charmaine Mendez, and I'll be sharing some adult programming ideas that you guys can use for this coming summer. Next slide, please. Uh, so as a reminder, um, I know all of you know, but a lot of adult patrons don't realize that summer reading is for them too. They think that is just for their children. So when parents sign up their kids for a summer reading, make sure to Kindly encourage them to sign up too. There's prizes and activities for them as well. And adults also provide a lot of feedback for our programs, uh, both positive and constructive criticism for how our libraries can do better. Uh, kids really look up to their parents for good behavior and good reading habits. The summer is also a great opportunity to promote literacy and literacy services and adults like to keep happy and busy, keep their brains active and love to do lifelong learning. So summer is the perfect opportunity for that. Um, next slide, please. So the first uh, idea that I have here is a campfire storytelling. So you can do it either in person or virtually. If you do it virtual on Zoom or another platform, on YouTube, they have a lot of really relaxing campfire videos that you can just uh, turn on. Um, if you do it in person, you can use like a safe source of light, such as the LED candle. Um, if COVID restric uh, restrictions um, allow a food, you can do a take home uh, kit for making s'mores. And this is just an opportunity for adults to share stories with one another whether it be scary stories, funny stories, um, beautiful family memories, just opportunity to keep storytelling and memories alive. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we have a program about edible plants and poisonous plants. Uh, you can get a staff member who is knowledgeable about this, or you can get someone from um, a botanical garden, a nature center, someone who would be knowledgeable about this topic. Um, they can um, also, uh, you can also provide uh, edible plants for examples uh, or encourage the patrons to go out into the wild and safely look for plants that are edible. So this picture here, I believe it's a Peruvian lily and it's one of the plants that are poisonous. Uh, next slide, please. Alternatively, you can also do a nature or history workshop. There's plenty of a wide variety of topics that you can do for this. You can get someone from a nature center, a museum, anyone from a local organization who may be knowledgeable about this. Uh, some of the topics that you could do are perhaps talking about the indigenous peoples who lived in your area maybe talking about where are the best hiking spots, the best nature spots, um, a lot of wonderful opportunities for this. Uh, next slide, please. Another idea you could do are bookmarks made out of pressed flowers or leaves. You can encourage your patrons to uh, get some flowers from their garden, pick some leaves that are on the ground uh, to make these beautiful bookmarks. The supplies are here on the screen and I can leave the link in the chat later uh, for the link for the instructions if you would like to see them. Um, if you do get flowers and leaves for the patrons uh, ahead of time, it's better to press them 
ahead of time because it does take some hours to make sure they're pressed properly. So uh, keep that in mind when putting together this program. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also do geocaching or letterboxing. Uh, we have a staff member who uh, is good at doing this and created one for our library. Um, if you don't know anyone who knows how to do this, you could partner with um, a local hiking trail, park, anyone you know who might have this as a hobby. Um, you can leave trinkets in the container for participants to take when they find your uh, geocaching location, or you can let them know they can leave trinkets too for others to find. Next slide, please. You can also do a take-home kit uh, for patrons to make their own postcards and letter writing. Uh, just put art and writing supplies in the bags, uh, such as blank postcards, any stickers, um, any little goodies so that they can write letters to their loved ones. Uh, if COVID restrictions allow, you can do an in-person program. They can write letters together, decorate them with the craft and art supplies, and it just keeps the art of letter writing alive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can also do a knitting boot camp. Uh, you can get someone from the community who knows how to knit to do a beginner's class. Maybe someone you know, someone from a craft supply store or art supply store. Uh, alternatively, you can also have a knitting social where everyone just works on their own projects and knits together. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also opportunity for doing a local author open mic. I know open mics and talent shows are pretty popular over the summer. This is a great opportunity for authors, no matter their level experience, uh, just to get comfortable talking in front of an audience and putting themselves out there uh, to read excerpts of their novels, short stories, poems, etc. cetera. Um, this is a great uh, opportunity for a virtual program on Zoom, or you could do it in person as well if COVID restrictions allow. Uh, our library did this program last month and the authors really appreciated it. So I highly recommend that you do this. And it also goes well with the 2023 summer theme as well. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also have a program about survival skills. You can book a presenter to teach survival skills like how to go a while without water, um, identifying animal tracks, building the shelter, uh, there's this website here I found from the resource guide, natedpro.org. They have information about a presenter who you can book who is knowledgeable about survival skills. Next slide, please. These are just some examples of decorating ideas for your adult patrons. You can make your own national park posters. Uh, they can create posters of local nature spots or their favorite park, anything like that, and include positive reviews. You can hang it up in the library. Um, they can also make their own postcards uh, using stationery and art supplies. And you just put it up on the bulletin board to display, kind of like camp postcards. Or you can do a survival theme book display, maybe even putting in some survival tools like a, a canteen or a compass. Um, some tools might be dangerous for children, so better to put them in a case or put them high up where kids can't reach. Next slide, please. And that's it for the adult programming ideas. If you have any questions about any of them, feel free to contact me at any time. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're moving on to outreach and inclusion and want to kindly thank one of our committee members, Edwin Rodarte, for helping contribute to these slides. Uh, next slide, please. So most libraries are familiar with the basics of doing outreach. There's print materials such as flyers, bookmarks, posters, et cetera. Some libraries like to do newsletters or email subscriptions to spread the word. Uh, partnering with local people in the community, different organizations is also a great way to spread the word. Uh, social media is very important. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera. And don't underestimate the power of word of mouth. A lot of uh, people who attend my programs, I noticed that they hear about the programs from 
staff members verbally telling them or their friend or family member told them. So definitely important. Uh, next slide, please. So it's good to remember that one type of outreach may not be appropriate for all libraries. It's definitely a very flexible and adaptable process, a learning experience, and it requires us to be sensitive to the needs of others in the community and being open and willing to learn about other cultures and beliefs and ways of thinking. And in keeping in mind that not all people within the community um, communicate in the same way because of their, their background, their cultural background. So just keeping that in mind, being mindful. Uh, next slide, please. So it's good to know the demographics of your community, um, the community's assets. It's important to make sure to have a goal in mind for your outreach and engagement with others. And it's very important to realize who exactly are you trying to reach? Uh, who in the community is not coming into the library? Who isn't aware of your programs and services? Those are the important ones that we had to reach. Next slide, please. So now before summer is here, now is a great time to review your planning strategy and programs for the summer. Is there anything that you can think of about your summer program that create a barrier to those who wanna participate? If so, what can you do differently based on previous years of summer programming? How can you make things more uh, accessible for others? Uh, next slide, please. So these are just a few examples of different kinds of multi-language support uh, that other libraries have been doing to reach out to others in the community. Um, and then as a reminder, in order to provide an equitable level of service to uh, all members of the community, regardless of ethnic, cultural, or linguistic background, uh, providing library materials in multiple languages it, should be, it shouldn't be seen as an extra service, but more as an integral part of library summer services. Next slide, please. Um, and then those who are physically not able to come into the library, or you know, perhaps COVID may still be going on next year, or someone may not have internet access. These are some of the ways that libraries could reach out to others in the community. Um, there's activity packets, craft kits, um, giving summer reading packets to schools, um, especially during their lunch, um, their outdoors lunch or anything like that is a good opportunity. Um, partnering with farmers markets, community centers, recreation services to do story times, pop-up programming. Um, you can reach out to businesses in the community to distribute your summer reading flyers and logs at different community events and their bulletin boards. Um, when you promote your virtual programs, it's good to also promote uh, the Wi-Fi hotspots in the city, or maybe your library might uh, circulate hotspots, uh, laptops, iPads, anything like that. Um, and then just making sure to engage people in other ways outside of the box in addition to reading and writing. Next slide, please. And that is it. So once again, here's my contact info. If you, any of you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me. Thank you. And I'll give it back to Nicole. Thank you again. Okay. So I just wanted to check in and see if there were any questions. I'm not sure if I should just look in the chat. Oh, here we go. Questions from the chat. Um, let's see. I am interested in knowing about any partnerships with the California State Parks next summer. Um, I don't know. Can someone else answer from the State Library? I'm not sure. Anyone? This is this is Trish. I, I'm actually just gonna I'll check in with our partners at the State Library just to see if there's something um, that might be going on that we're not aware of. We know lots of libraries partner with um state parks and local parks um individually but we'll check in and if that person could put their email in there in the chat or email the summer your library um email account which is also in the chat we'll make sure to get back to them 
And then I see a question about purchase orders for the iRead store. And um, that was answered already with a yes. And then when you're changing. When you are taking the kids out on a nature walk, is this most recommended for a library that has an outdoor space that's really easy to access? Or do you think you could make it work in places with less outdoor access too? Um, um, I, oh, go oh, ahead, Rachel. Sorry. No, you go. I know for um, when we do the nature walk, I'm actually in a joint use facility. So I'm inside of a high school. So you can imagine we have very limited nature <laughs> areas. So we really do make the best out of it. And especially with like little learners, imagination is everything. We have been on our tummies with our little magnifying glasses, looking at the grasses, the grass area and trying to find bugs or you just, you really think outside of the box in your very small box <laughs> location that you're at. I think I have like four small natural areas around the high school. So yes, it definitely is possible. Thank you, Rachel. Um, are, these got, are these ideas available in the resource guide? So I can say for me, for the teen ideas, I, some are in the resource guide and some were not. Um, and I, I don't know if that's the same for other people that were presenting, if you guys want to chime in. Um, yeah, I don't same. think they're in the resource guide, but I did put a link to them. I can post it in again, just in case. Um, but yeah, I don't think mine were. But you have our email, so yes, please email please. all of us if you have any questions or need details. Be glad. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if I could just uh, interject one thing, this is Jill from iRead. Um, every year at this at this presentation, I I'm sad because there are so many good ideas that are not in the resource guide. So please start thinking now about what you would present next year and get it into the resource guide for 2023. Thanks. That's just my two cents. That's a good reminder. Thank you, Jill. Um, will this session be available as a recording afterward? Yes, it will be. Um, and then where do you get the resource guide? I think Trish may have typed something in here to answer this question. Um, most of it, like for me, my library purchased it. I'm not sure, Trish, if you want to ex expand on that. Sure. Yeah. So part of the summer in your library grant, um, all Calif all interested California libraries can receive an iRead mm -hmm. resource guide for each of their um, branches free of charge. So if you're not sure if your library has ordered one, I've put the email address to the Summit Your Library project in the chat and just shoot us an email. We can check to see if they've been ordered. Um, we've already sent out the digital versions and the print and flash drive versions should be um, going out to libraries in the next uh, just couple of weeks momentarily. But if you're not sure, um, just send us an email. And if your library hasn't ordered one, we can put an order in for your library so that you, you will receive one free of charge. You do not need to purchase them. I did just receive mine here, my, my oh. paper my Great. physical copy, Great. Then like within the last couple of days. So they're coming. Right. Um, let's see, do you have any suggestions for presenting programs to individuals with special needs? Example is ASD. Any thoughts, Mary? I know for like the programs that I offer at uh, my library, everything is very easily adaptable to hmm. whatever little learner walks through my doors. So anything that I, you know, even from, for instance, a hundred three-year-olds is very overwhelming, um, especially those with like sensory um, disorders. And so I either revamp everything physically or I rethink some of the activities that I'm offering. But absolutely, I think, I mean, I think everybody has, adaptable ideas for anything that we've been offering. And if you have any questions, again, please reach out. Well, I think too, that's something else kind of that I've learned with like the whole grab and go and having um, different programs available different ways or the same program available different ways. Not everybody experiences it the same way. So maybe they don't wanna come to a group of 50 people. Maybe they're still concerned about COVID. Maybe they don't wanna be in groups, but having a 
either a, an option where they can do it at home, provide them the supplies, they can do it at home where maybe they're more comfortable, and then having some sort of video tutorial or something where they can experience that at their own pace and you know relieve that any of that kind of stress that comes along with a hundred other three-year-olds. Um, let's see. <laughs> Oh, Natalie said, Natalie said, dear public, oh, mm -hmm. as I'm reading things to myself, the, oh, somebody what? got their print version, so yay. Nicole, yeah. I'm just wondering yeah. if we could advance to the, just because we're running so late, yeah. and we're yeah. go. on the call to answer all questions. If you yeah. want to just go to the next, do the plugs on the next slide, yeah. and then yeah. we'll stay and answer any questions. Of course. So it'll be, um, somebody had asked about if it was recorded, so it'll be added to the resource section of the Summer at Your Library website, which is listed right there. And the, I always have to do this, but the best part of this is that you can be a part of our committee. So if you are interested, you can email that or send a message to that email. If you have any questions, you can reach out to any of us that are on the group, in the group, and we will be happy to answer any of your questions. And again, don't forget to submit your programming ideas for the 2023 Find Your Voice Resource Guide. You have a few more months to do that until the end of February. And thank you for joining us. I apologize for going a little long. <laughs> and now we, yeah, we will definitely stay on to answer any more questions. Okay, let me see where it's. Um, do you all or your libraries think you will be doing programs with performers or will you all be avoiding that for a little while longer? Um, I can only say for us, um, we haven't, again, I know everyone's in different parts of the state. You know, I'm in the Bay Area and we've always been uh, really kind of, I feel like a lot stricter than in other parts of the state um, as far as mask wearing and social distancing and all that stuff. So like, I haven't even done story time yet here. I know some people have done story time at their libraries already. So we're not looking to start that till next year, but they are thinking of doing some presenters or performers for summer. Um, I think we were just kind of waiting for that younger group of kids to be um, eligible for vaccinations. So um, we do plan to do set, uh, nowhere near like our normal, usual onslaught of performers, but definitely kind of slowly reintroducing some of our um, things that we did pre-pandemic. Um, but that's just me and we can see if some of the other members want to talk. I know we're planning on bringing them back next summer. This past summer, it was all virtual, which was still really awesome with all the different um, outlets that you can do live programming through. Um, it was still interactive. Everybody seemed to have a great time. Um, again, depending on what summer 2022 looks like, um, we will for sure have performers. Now, if that's in person or we do um, virtual again, we would have to wait and see. I was going to say, Rachel, I feel like some um, performers actually, or programs were almost better virtually. Like yeah. for me, like if it's an animal program, like it, they get so close to the animals. And if you came to the library, you're in your number 200 in the back, you can't see anything. So there were exactly. some programs that I felt like virtually was, they just did so well. I look forward to hoping that it uh, continues that option for sure. And actually, if you, you know, any library, if you want to just put in the chat what your plans are for if you know your library's planning on performers or not, I'm sure people would be interested to sort of see. Do you want to just put that in the chat? Let's see. Um, last summer, we repeated the same activity at multiple times during the week to keep the group smaller and not have people feel like they are missing out. We did two sessions on Tuesday, two sessions on Wednesday of the same thing. That's a really good idea keep the numbers kind of down and people can spread out. I like that idea. Um, I saw someone had asked how I transfer out the weekly bulletin board. Oh, volunteers, volunteers. And if we are not have, I know last summer we did not have volunteers. Um, we have started having them again, but if for whatever reason we don't, then um, all staff pitched in and those that, you know, our, our pages, they are clerks, those of us that usually don't implement programming or displays absolutely love to have the opportunity to help. Oh, that's a really good point. It looks like a, a pe some people are doing performers, um, a lot of stuff outside. So that's a good bonus about summer. If you don't live somewhere that's blazingly hot, outside is a, is a good idea. 
um, or some, in a park at San Diego Library. They are doing in-person programming, but it depends on the location and performers. We are limited only due to contracting issues with our purchasing and contract department. Some people have been doing, already been doing programs in the summer or since last summer. Um, outside indoor events will be limited performers with face covering requirements. So I mean, ooh, and a clause that in their contract saying that their performances will switch to virtual in case restrictions happen again. That's, that's our life now. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it seems like everybody's kind of maybe dipping their toes into doing some things maybe like we were doing before, but there's still some hesitation, which I think is um, reasonable how things kind of go up and down. Um, let's see, Charmaine says, um, having a presenter for an adult program, that's, I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm even still a little nervous, you know, with like the itty, the teeny tinies, like the babies and the one-year-olds coming back to the library. So it seems like adults and teens are a, a good spot to maybe have some in-person programming. Again, it just depends on what's going on in your location. Um, and I think, I think that's all the questions. Yeah. So I guess we will end our presentations, but if you have any questions, please, 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 please contact either summer at your library at cla-net.org or email any of us. Um, and we'll be happy to get you guys any information that you need on specific programs that we talked about. And please, please, please join our group. We have lots of fun, right? Yes, come join the committee, please. Yes, Absolutely. get in touch. We love your ideas and to work with you um, and we will send a link out to the recording and any responses that we promised about questions that were in the chat that we were unable to uh, answer today uh, and someone's asking could you each retype your emails in the chat yes so we hope it's a good rest of the day and a good week for you all as you uh, go your merry ways thank you so much for joining us